Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tony and mayors, and to all of you. What an honor it is to be asked to be the keynote speaker at the seventh annual Human Rights Banquet. Uh, you know, I, I got to tell you a funny little thing, though. As, as I was sitting down uh, at my chair here, I was talking to some of those at my table about the fact that, you know, the focus this time is on Canada-U.S. relationships. Uh, it is, though, a human rights banquet, and, and there are some clear, relate, clear uh, connections there, very clear and obvious ones, but there are also some distinctions there, and I was, wasn't quite sure what I should talk about. And then uh, Mayor Priest gave it to me. I'll talk about Highway 95. <laughs> Actually, uh, Karen Roeder at our table here, my uh, assistant here in the Coeur d'Alene area, uh, she runs the Coeur d'Alene area for me in my office, uh, and, well, the whole north, really. And uh, she just, we were, again, we were at the table talking uh, a little bit about what I should say, and she says, Mike, just don't create an international incident. <laughs> <laughs> well, Karen, I'll try not to. <laughs> um, but seriously, what I thought I would do is to talk a little bit about Canada-U.S. relations and then move in uh, to a, a more broad perspective on uh, human relations and human rights in general and then wrap it up. But to start out, I think I'll tell you a little bit more about my cousin, Greg Carr, because I was thinking um, this, this, this actually has something to do with the Canada-U.S. issue that I want to talk about. But uh, I was here in Coeur d'Alene last week at, at several events, and in fact, I was here several times over the last couple of weeks. And at one of the meetings, somebody who knew that Greg Carr was my cousin came up and you know, was talking to me about it. And, and I said, yeah, he's not just a cousin, but we actually grew up in the same city, and we were really close cousins. We played together, and m my mother and his mother are sisters, and, and like his mother's like my second mother, and vice versa. And he said, well, which one of you was the toughest? And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, did you whip on him or did he whip on you? And I thought about it and I said, well, you know, actually he's three or four years younger than I am. So growing up, I was always just a little bit bigger. But I never did have any fights with him because, you know, he and I were both so committed to each other's human rights that we just didn't get into that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I want to talk a little bit about Canada. U.S. relations. Right now, uh, Tony alluded to the fact that, that uh, I'm involved in the U.S. Senate with regard to Canada and U.S. relations. What that involves is there is a group called the Canada-U.S. Interparliamentary Group. And it is basically senators and House members from the United States and members of both houses in Canada who get together on an annual basis for a meeting and then also, as needed in between, we have a lot of of uh, interrelationship, but we relationship, but we try to work together as legislators to better understand each other's circumstances and to deal with those circumstances in a way that will foster better relations between our two nations. And uh, a year ago, or a little more than a year ago, uh, the majority leader in the Senate, Bill Frist, came to me and. I had been on some Canadian uh, trade missions and, and had been involved with Canada on a number of different fronts, and he knew that, and, and he came and he asked if I would be willing to be the chairman. There's a, there's a House and a Senate chairman on the U.S. side and a similar uh, pair of chairmen on the Canadian side. He asked me if I would be the Senate chairman uh, for the U.S. Canada, or the Canada-U.S. interparliamentary group. I said, sure, I would love to. And so we had our first annual meeting shortly after that. Uh, that year, last year, it was in Niagara. And uh, I went there and I met uh, Jerry Grafstein, who is my counterpart in Canada. And, and my other counterpart, uh, Joe Camuzzi, is now a member of the cabinet, I think. But he's moved on up into the government with the new government there. And, and so uh, another member of parliament who I will meet soon, Susan Whalen, is taking over that other position. The reason I tell you this is because uh, as the chairman, we rotate these meetings each year between the U.S. and Canada, and last year, of course, it was in Canada. This year, it's in the United States, and I'm the chairman. And so I get to pick where it is, and guess where it's going to be? Idaho Falls. <laughs> Not Idaho Falls, Coeur d'Alene. <laughs> Should have picked Idaho Falls, shouldn't I? 
But in June of this year, we're going to have the Canada-U.S. Interparliamentary Group here. And so we'll have a number of senators and congressmen and, and uh, their counterparts from the Parliament in Canada who will be here. And we will be talking about a number of the kinds of issues there are between our nations. But what I have found, and, and uh, our good friends on the Canadian side are every bit as committed to this as we are here, is that although we have a lot of issues between us, the United States and Canada, in my opinion, are the best friends among nations that there, there are in the globe. We are each other's strongest trading partners. Now, I'll, I'll try to get this percentage right, but I believe that 85% of Canada's exports go to the United States. And 75% of Canada's imports come from the United States. There's a, and, and I don't know the percentage for the United States, but the point is that Canada is our largest trading partner in the world. And we are Canada's largest and most significant trading partner in the world. Another thing that I learned as I have been working uh, with Canadian issues is that um, some, an incredibly high percentage of the Canadian population, m many of you probably know this, I think it's something like 99% of the Canadian population live within 100 miles of the United States border. It's a very narrow band of population in Canada in terms of the depth away from the U.S. border. And as you know here, living in a border state, we have incredible opportunities to associate and to affiliate with our friends in Canada. And the first message I have here tonight uh, for our friends from Canada is that we consider you to be our strongest ally and we consider you to be our best friend. Yeah. Now, the reason I told the story about my cousin Greg and I uh, is because occasionally cousins do have tussles, and uh, occasionally nations who are best friends have issues. But the United States and Canada have been able consistently to maintain incredibly good relations. I have in front of me a set of the issues that we will discuss in this parliamentary group in June when we come, and, and uh, they are broad and diverse. Uh, we'll be discussing everything from prescription drugs and health care, agriculture, food safety, uh, which includes a lot of issues relating to things like uh, potatoes and, and other crops, BSE, and, and other issues like that that are very difficult issues between our nations. Uh, we'll be discussing softwood lumber. We have litigation going on between our nations in the, in the context of softwood lumber. We'll be discussing our joint efforts on combating terrorism and the issues in the greater Middle East, in North Korea, Iran, Africa, nuclear proliferation, uh, bilateral defense partnerships, border security, environmental standards, energy and petroleum trade, electricity inoper interoperability and reliability, and so forth. Now, as I go through this list of issues, it probably sounds like a government guy talking to you about all sorts of government issues, but all of these issues deal with the relations between our people. Whether it's a cattleman on either side of the border who are concerned about BSE, mad cow disease, and the impact of that on our trade relations, or those who are agricultural producers in one context or another, or those who are concerned about the price of gas and and heating their homes in, in cold winters. Uh, all kinds of issues like that are critical between our two nations. And the opportunity that we have to build stronger friendships is important. And as a result of efforts like the Canada-US Interparliamentary Group and many others, not the least of which is this one that's been going on in Coeur d'Alene this week, uh, we are able to build stronger relationships between our two nations. Despite all the differences that we have, there are fewer differences between us than we have between any other major trading partner or any other major relationship that we have in the world. And so, as I said, Canada and the United States work hand in glove on most issues. And where we have differences, sometimes we fight it out hard but we fight it out in the context of that overriding principle that we are each other's closest friend and strongest ally. And so I say to, uh, to all of us here, I, I thank you for recognizing that, Tony, and for setting up that dynamic here, and for helping us 
in North Idaho here to develop a strong relationship with a good, good friend across the border. Now let me stop there for a moment and, and turn to human rights in a, on a broader sense. You know, when you think about the words racism and discrimination or similar words, it conjures up frightening images of burning crosses or of ugly swastikas slashed across doorways or cattle cars full of people waiting for a gas chamber and all kinds of other terrible atrocities that have occurred in this world. But it also conjures up other subtle in images, a pejorative glance, lost employment or housing or education opportunities, an unthinking remark or a reference in a, based on a stereotype, a social exclusion, and all kinds of other, frankly, very inappropriate things that happen between people when we let ourselves get caught up in that type of thinking. Fear and ignorance, in, in my opinion, give individuals and groups a socially detrimental framework of reference that lends itself to destructive activities and noxious ideologies. The charge of racism is extremely serious. And over the past decade and a half, Idaho has borne the unfortunate media fallout, resulting from the actions of a very small number of citizens who have chosen to make our state their home. And the activities undertaken by these groups have produced a disproportionate response in the national media, perpetuating a myth that is wildly inaccurate and attributes a remarkably iniquitous label to the overwhelming majority of Idahoans who don't espouse these abhorrent beliefs. But I can tell you that because of the kinds of activities of people like you. That is changing. Over the last 10 years in the United States Congress where I have served, the number of times that people will say to me, oh, that's where the Aryan nations are, or isn't that where the people are so intolerant, has increasingly reduced. And the reason is because you have never quit. You have stuck to it. I think, was it 23 years you said, Tony? February of 1981, when you, a group of you first met in a home and decided something had to be done. And you know, you could have been frustrated. There were times when court cases required that, your, that those who were causing this trouble had the right to do what they had the right to do in our society, in our free society. And yet you didn't stop, you didn't quit, and you kept fighting. Education is the first step towards dispelling myths and changing incorrect perceptions. And with that goal in mind, you went forward and took actions. And let me just, you know, you all know this, but let me just review it with you. I'm going to miss some of them. If Tony were up here, he could really lay it out. But I remember in 1998 when I was campaigning here for my first Senate race, it was the lemons to lemonade issue. You remember that? I, I've walked into town as a candidate, and I may have been you, Tony, but somebody working with you hit me before I was in the city boundaries more than about 10 minutes and, and asked me for a pledge, which I gave. And uh, the pledge was, for those that aren't familiar with it or, or maybe new here, the, the, the people would, would pledge a certain amount of money for every minute that the Aryan nations got to march, because they, they had the right, the court-ordered right, I guess, to hold a parade. And so you decided you were going to raise money for human rights out of that. And for every minute they marched, people would contribute money that would then be given to the local schools and to other educational opportunities to train people and educate people about human rights. And I believe the march went on for 27 minutes, and you made $35,000. <laughs> and there have been any number of other things that have developed here in the community, uh, not the least of which is something that I know you're going to talk about a little later tonight, namely the fact that when those who espouse these terrible beliefs decided that they wanted to get involved and start trying to get some of them elected to public office, the community was called upon to respond and increase their voter turnout dramatically 
and overwhelmingly rejected the candidates who had these terrible principles. Well, let me just talk a little bit about Idaho's record. I've talked a little bit about the things that you have done, and like I say, Tony could expand on that dramatically. But Idaho began its notable history in human rights preservation as a fledgling six-year-old state. Idaho granted women voting rights in 1896, being the fourth state in the union to act on women's suffrage. Eighteen years later, Moses Alexander became the governor of Idaho and the first Jewish governor in the nation. And in 1969, the Idaho Human Rights Commission was formed, and three years later, Idaho became the first state to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment. According to research done by the Idaho Human Rights Commission, the Idaho State Legislature has passed more anti-hate crime legislation than any other state. And Lou Reed, I was there in the Idaho Senate when you brought some of that forward and we passed it. And, and, uh, <laughs> and I voted right on that, didn't I? <laughs> Some of those statutes include the Idaho Malicious Harassment Act, the Civil Remedies Act, the Domestic Terrorist Control Act, and the Uniform Hate Crimes Reporting Act. And that's just a, num a couple of the ones. I noticed on the website, I was checking your website out before I came to speak tonight, you've got a lot of statutes listed there on your website that, that uh, list these things that can be used to help defend against human rights violations. In 2000, the Southern Poverty Law Center recognized the existence of 70 separate human rights organizations throughout the state of Idaho, but you didn't know that there were that many in Idaho. More than any other state in the union in proportion to our population. Based on the state's population, that means that approximately, we have approximately one group for every 18,571 people. And just to give you a comparison, in the same survey, New York had 114 human rights organizations statewide, or approximately one for every 166,667 people. California had 95, or one for every 357,000 people. The human rights organizations in Idaho are largely community-based, which means they've been formed at the grassroots levels by individuals responding to human rights violations in their communities. And that is a tribute to Idaho. And right here in Kootenai County, the, the Kootenai County Task Force on Human Rights is a perfect example of that kind of an activity. In 1987, the Northwest Coalition Against Malicious Harassment, a multi-state organization, was started by a Coeur d'Alene resident. And the same year, Coeur d'Alene received an All-American City designation from the National Civic League for its accomplishments in the fields of human rights. And three years later, the, the city of Coeur d'Alene was the only city in the nation to receive the Raoul Wallenberg Civic Award given to communities who demonstrate outstanding support for human rights. And I go through this, I, I guess as a way to make it very clear, not only to us, but to those who will listen, that in Idaho, we have a solid belief in human rights. And although some have chosen to live here, the fact is, who, who do not believe in human rights, the fact is that they are in the incredibly small minority. In fact, didn't they get only 50 votes in the, out of 2,200 votes, only 50 people voted, cast their vote in that direction. And I dare say that that, uh, that is a testament to the people of Hayden, and it is a reflection, they are a reflection of the people of the state at large in their commitment to protecting and standing up for human rights. Idahoans have found unique and creative ways to combat these hate groups while upholding the constitutional guarantee of free speech. And the lemons to lemonade is probably the most creative one that I've seen. And then recently, I'll get back to my cousin Greg Carr for a minute. Recently, after the uh, litigation, and Tony was telling me as we were sitting here, you know, the jury, voted the right way, the people of Hayden voted the right way, the Idaho legislature has voted the right way, the
the Idaho people have stood up in many different ways and have voted the right way. And, uh, and hopefully, some of the national media will continue to get the picture and report it in the right way. And when that jury voted the right way, it created an opportunity for the Carr Foundation to step in and purchase the compound, raise it, R-A-Z-E, I think is the right spelling, and eliminate all of the memory of the wrong that was being done there, and it's now a peace park in which we have an opportunity to once again put forward our platform as a people supporting human rights. Idaho also stands out in its efforts to educate people about the dangers of racism and discrimination. The Idaho Human Rights Education Center was established to foster appreciation of diversity and preservation of human rights. There is an annual conference held in Sun Valley entitled the Idaho Hispanic Youth Hispo Symposium, where approximately 300 Hispanic youth gather to engage in dialogues affecting them. Recently, we have been able to build the Hispanic Cultural Center in Caldwell, and we are developing a significant opportunity there for the people of Idaho from different cultures to understand the Hispanic people who represent a significant portion of our population. The Hispanic people have joined with the Indian tribes and they are working together in a number of different contexts in this same type of opportunity to build and foster friendship and I guess I would say collaborative approaches to solving problems that we have in our society that may come up in relationship to race. In 1998, the Idaho Black History Museum opened in Boise. The museum is dedicated to preserving stories and artifacts recounting the history of African American in Idahoans. Boise is also the home to the only Anne Frank Memorial in the United States. And over the years, to get back to our tribal leaders, they have consistently pursued meaningful dialogue with our state, local, and federal officials in order to promote mutual respect, collaboration, and education. And I can tell you my office has a tremendously good relationship with our tribes. Uh, we have the, the chairman of the Coeur d'Alene tribe and a number of the members of the tribe here with us today to help us respect and honor our commitment to human rights. These activities... <laughs> These activities have dramatically improved circumstances for the tribes as well as for the rest of the people in Idaho over the past years, in addition to contributing to a renewed sense of pride in their heritage as Native Americans. Idaho has a distinguished history of combating racism and discrimination, and Idahoans should be proud of their heritage and their accomplishments in the field of human rights. Together, we can work together to combat hate and dispel incorrect assumptions about our great state. And before I conclude, I just want to stop and talk for a moment about another piece of the human rights problem. There are a lot of different aspects to it. You could look at it in terms of international relationships. You can look at it in terms of racial or sexual or other types of issues. Um, you can look at it in community or state levels, any number of different ways. One way that has really, that, that I personally have become really involved in is the question of violence against women and children. And this hit me really hard about eight years ago when I was a congressman. I had an opportunity, and I, I won't for obvious reasons say where, but an opportunity here in Idaho to go to a safe home which is where women who have been abused and who basically are prisoners in their own homes sometimes have an opportunity to go for protection. I say sometimes because we don't have enough safe homes and we don't have enough circumstances and protection in the law to make it so that it's a safe decision for them to, to exercise that route all the time. But I was able to go there and meet with a number of women who literally had to make the decision to leave their own home with their children because they were prisoners in their own home and faced 
abusive violence. And it just tore at my heartstrings. And then later that same day, I had an opportunity to go to a home. It was another safe home. This one was a home for children who had to be taken away from their own parents because of very dangerous circumstances and very significant abuse. And I met there a couple of little kids. It was a boy and a girl, a brother and a sister. They were, oh, I'd say five years old and eight years old, approximately. The boy was younger. And I'm not even going to tell you what had happened to these kids except to tell you that they were physically so injured and abused <clears throat> that they had permanent physical damage. And they were so psychologically injured from seeing each other hurt that they had serious psychological problems. And seeing this changed my life. As I talked to law enforcement officials and workers who told me that this was not an unusual circumstance, either for children or for women, and that we did not have enough safe homes that we did not have enough protection in the law. Believe it or not, to protect these children, and very often their mothers, against this kind of abuse. And to me, that is a human rights violation. And I realize that we have very well organized groups today. I know that I was talking to Tony about this. There are very well organized groups. Uh, and you, you work hand in glove with them when these kinds of issues come to your organizations. But we need to be stronger in this arena. I left that room eight years ago like I say, touched in a way that it is still hard for me to handle when I stop and focus on it. And I committed that I would do everything that I could to try to help change the circumstance. Since that time in Congress, we have passed the Violence Against Women's Act. We've reauthorized it. We've expanded it. It took us two, almost three years just to get protection under the act for women who weren't married but who were in a dating relationship. Now, why would it take us three years to protect a woman simply because she wasn't married? But we got it. And we have gotten increased funding to try to get some more support out there. And we're working on it again right now. But it doesn't all happen at the federal level. And I just want to, in addition to commending you, and I mean you specifically and us as Idahoans on the incredibly good record we have, I want to encourage us to redouble our efforts and to reach out to those in our society who are at risk. They can be at risk in many, many different ways. And when that comes as a result of racism or discrimination or intolerance, of another people, then we must stop it. And I just want to conclude in the context of the violence against women and children by saying to the men in this room, obviously no one should be engaged in act, acts of violence. And I assume that the vast majority and hopefully all the men in this room are not in that category. 
But we as men need to be speaking out louder and standing up stronger and telling the other men in our society that that kind of behavior will not be tolerated, will be stopped, and will be punished. I didn't mean to bring the conclusion of my re remarks out on a low note or anything, but, but I guess I just really want to say that we have an incredibly good record in Idaho. We are a people who are committed to these kinds of things, and I just encourage us all to redouble our efforts, to look at our society and see where there are still problems, and then stand solidly like you all are in a strong united front to protect the weakest among us, those who need our help the most. And thank you very much for having me here with you tonight.